There was no bigger topic in the seventh generation of consoles than zombies, kicking the era off with some pretty groundbreaking titles like Dead Rising and the zombie mode featured in Call of Duty World at War. There were zombie games made in the past of course, you've got your classic Resis and Dooms which were released way back, but zombies definitely became a trend during this console generation in particular. Looking at World at War is a prime example of what I perceive were arguably the two most prominent trends of this generation, which eventually ended up getting carried over to future generations too. And that's first person shooters and zombies. But after a while, you began to see a pushback from critics and even fans of these types of games, where after a certain point, zombies were seen as being overdone, a sentiment that I pretty much agree with. It seemed like almost everything at a certain point had a zombie element to them, some being good, like the fantastic Undead Nightmare DLC for Red Dead Redemption, and others being, uh, not so great. But a game that still gets talked about to this day, and one that's always been somewhat close to my heart, is the Dead Island series. Being released in what was the Apex of the zombie craze in my opinion. Dead Island was developed by Techland and published by Deep Silver, with the whole concept being that, well, you were fighting the dead on an island. <laughs> sounds quite standard, something that could have potentially slipped through the cracks if not for the fantastic marketing on the run up to its release, the most notable of which featured an incredibly heavy trailer of a family basically being overrun by zombies until they all end up being infected in one way or another. It's genuinely quite powerful, but for anyone who knows what the finished product actually is, you'll know this trailer doesn't reflect the game at all. Hilariously, the tone of the game is almost the polar opposite to this, but getting into the actual game, it doesn't really try to hide that fact, as from the intro which plays when launching the game, you see it's actually going for a more cynical approach to its story. But hell, with how everything plays out, that might even be giving it too much credit, I'll be real. It might not be as impactful as the trailer, but I can't lie, it's still such a great opening, primarily because of the character Sam B, who performs his song Who Do You Voodoo. The character we're seeing this cutscene through doesn't matter, but it's the several other characters, those being Logan, Sam B, Perna, and Jian Mei, which we all end up stumbling across, performing what were their actual jobs before everything goes haywire. Well, all except Logan, who's literally just getting drunk at a bar. You know who I am. Give any idea But in his dialogue, we can see he was an ex-football player. The rest of the cutscene is focused around setting up the zombie outbreak, with the security guard getting bit halfway through, and Jian Mei trying to actually treat a zombie when we enter the toilets. Not to mention, the location is set up straight away from the opening image. We appear to be at some kind of beach resort, which inevitably ends up playing into aspects like the appearance of several characters and zombies we come across, as well as the general atmosphere overall. That's just the intro though, which in terms of the characters I think works well enough to show what all their roles were before this zombie outbreak. But when we actually end up hitting play, the first thing we're made to do is pick who we want to play as, including a fully voiced character bio when picking each each individual one. I grew up in New Orleans, Lower Ninth Ward. My daddy went to prison when I was two. Die. That would be fine, but the game treats these bios like a get out of jail free card in many ways, as in the actual game, most of their backstories aren't elaborated on any further. And realistically, with how cookie cutter all of the dialogue is here, without reading these, you could go the entire game not really knowing about any of these characters' backstories and be none the wiser by the end. Apart from maybe Sam B, these guys are the most bog standard, stereotypical group I could think of. And to be honest, that doesn't even get much better when looking at their bios, which makes me think their personalities weren't even a priority. Weird, considering they actually try to pull off emotional and impactful beats with these guys, which oftentimes are such a hilarious failure, but whatever. Chances are you won't be picking any of these characters for their personalities anyways, but instead for their styles, and also perhaps their stats and abilities, which can also be seen under their name. But I'm gonna say for the record that none of these really matter. The fact is, you can pick whatever character you want and get through the game fine regardless, which is the appropriate option for a game that a lot of people will be playing by themselves. But as you can see, all the characters have varying amounts of health, speed, and stamina, with the different values being quite negligible between all the characters, as the lowest one of these can get is Logan's stamina, which is set to 80. There's no actual clue on how this static number will affect the character's stamina in the actual game compared to the others, but I suppose it'll improve replayability in some ways. And of course, there's also their weapon specialties, ranging from Perna, who's a firearm expert, to Sam B, who's a blunt weapon expert. These most importantly affect the skill trees in the game, which for the most part are actually pulled off pretty well, 
but we'll get into them in a second. All you really need to be informed on here are the expert abilities. No matter who I was playing as, the stat differences were so minor, they never ended up affecting my experience in any way. Which is good to be honest, as if they did, I imagine I'd likely see that as a negative. But let's not forget, the most important reason these multiple characters are here isn't for variety in the single player, but instead the co-op mode, likely being the reason why so many people think incredibly fondly of Dead Island due to their time spent with friends. In my opinion, that's where this choice really matters, as although you can end up with four Sam B's in your game at once, it genuinely makes for a more interesting and authentic experience if you've got one of each character on your team. The intro prologue is fine, having some nice references to the Dead Island trailer, where we can stumble across the bodies of the parents we see be killed, but it tries to start the game off with a sort of horror atmosphere, which once again just feels confused, as the game never ends up returning to this tone for the rest of the experience. But on the same merit, perhaps it only happens here due to the fact we're fresh out of water, and unsure about our environment and how powerful the zombies actually are here. It does give the player a good chance to get to grips with a few of the mechanics that are heavily emphasised over the game though, first of which being the looting, where we can search tons of objects like cupboards, luggage and chests, which end up giving us money, weapons and parts to upgrade and modify our weapons later on. It's primarily an atmosphere builder over everything else though, as shown by how we can actually skip this prologue on new playthroughs. It works as a transition to the main bulk of the island basically, being saved by a lifeguard called Cinemoy, who takes us to this hut filled with survivors, in which our first combat encounter has us saving his life in return. So enough build up, let's actually get our teeth into this game and start figuring out why Dead Island built up this reputation as a fun, unique zombie game compared to many others. And I suppose with us helping out Cinemoy, there's no better place to start than the combat. In my opinion, this is easily one of Dead Island's biggest strengths. The combat's pretty great throughout, with lots of elements that go into making it satisfying. Starting with the basics, as you see here, you can pick up a variety of weapons throughout the game to fend off against these zombie hordes. Yet another aspect that I think has pulled off very well. You'll start the game off with more of a scavenger's mindset, scraping around for any kind of wooden paddles or planks that you can get your hands on. But after a certain point, you'll end up finding far more effective pieces of weaponry through your time searching. Weapons like machetes and sledgehammers, which as I say, can be found from optional exploration on the player's part, which is great, but are also given out from characters that we do quests for too. Using these weapons on the zombies lets us into numerous discoveries though, ones affecting our player, our weapons, and the zombies themselves. Whacking a zombie in this game will never not be satisfying to me. In terms of the damage that's conveyed on screen, hitting zombies with blunt weaponry like hammers and pipes shows the zombies being flung around like a ragdoll, which is primarily because we are actually working with ragdoll physics here, which mainly present themselves when the zombies actually get killed. Most weapons have a fantastic impact on the zombies, once again varying between what type of weapon you're actually using. <laughs> Huge amounts of blood will always be shooting out of the zombies regardless, but when using weapons like the machete for example, you'll see that depending on what body part you're focusing your attacks on, there's a high chance for one of these to actually be cut off, either killing the zombie in the process if you cut off things like their heads, or rendering them less effective in combat by slicing off their arms or legs. This is already immensely satisfying. I loved every single time I was wailing on a zombie, only to have their head fly off in the final hit, which not to mention is accompanied very well by the slow motion effect which oftentimes gets introduced during these moments, really letting you bask in the sheer gore that's taking place. <laughs> But aside from the blades, you can also use blunt weapons to a similar effect. It's not as visually striking as seeing the zombies' body parts fly off and fall to the ground, but still just as effective with how we can target these same kind of body parts and actually break them, once again rendering things like arms and legs completely useless, as well as having the zombie's head be completely caved in compared to being sliced off. <laughs> All this stuff is great, visually I still find it to be impressive today, and in terms of the gameplay, it introduces one of the many ways you could be tackling an encounter with the undead. The flow of combat is all dependent on aspects like what weapons you're using, what parts of the body you're targeting, and how you're managing your stamina during these encounters. Starting with the stamina, this is an element which definitely brings balance to a lot of these combat scenarios, but also has many pitfalls which made certain parts of the game arduous at points. Firstly, the stamina presents a good back and forth during fights, where you're having to 
both avoid the zombie swings and grabs, while simultaneously getting your own hits in. And with every swing from your weapon using up various amounts of stamina, once again being dependent on what weapon you're actually using, you use up stamina during attacks and regain it when going on the defensive. As you could assume, this is something that is brilliant at the start of the game, when the experience will be more linear and standard for most people's playthroughs, but does eventually end up presenting some issues in the latter parts of the game, when the zombie's health starts dramatically increasing in accordance with your rising level. Weapons you would have previously used become less effective on these stronger enemies, and that's just talking about the base zombies. Some of the special enemies we can find eventually become incredibly frustrating to go up against, if you're lacking in the weapons department. Stamina isn't just used up during fights however, but of course is also used when performing actions like jumping and sprinting, and running around in particular is something you do far too much of in this game, especially in the later areas, which I think are nowhere near as well designed as the initial resort section. Running out of stamina when just trying to get to somewhere can be very annoying, especially when there's no substantial threats around. It can sometimes be engaging when being chased by one of the infected zombie types, which can sprint after you and deal multiple swipes of damage in quick succession, but it's not worth it for the other annoyances here. Continuing to sprint when your stamina's low presents this really horrible blur effect on the screen, which can't be turned off by normal in-game means. And not to mention that when you have zero stamina, you'll also be knocked over by any attack that comes up against you. Something I started off enjoying solely in the combat encounters, as once again it presents this nice to and fro during the fight, but I quickly became annoyed due to it not really having any substantial impact on the actual game. I'd understand if getting knocked over meant you were then vulnerable to other attackers, but you'll notice they just stand by and watch as you slowly pick yourself back up, which is very underwhelming. So stamina in general was great for the flow of fights, not so great in terms of the actual world traversal. I really just think they should have kept it solely to the attacks to be honest, as it doesn't enhance any part of running about the world. The weapons, on the whole, were handled pretty well for the most part. As I mentioned, there's a nice progression we see throughout the game where the more you level up, the higher tiers of weaponry you'll be finding, being categorised with a typical common, rare and ultra rare tier system. The different types of weapons have different effects on the zombies, knives cut, morning stars smash and so on. But that's an element you'll actually want to be focusing on more, as it could change your playstyle quite a bit. These weapons all have stats, which can either be observed in your inventory, or more conveniently, when the weapon's lying on the ground. They use colour coding effectively here, so that you don't have to actually read all the corresponding numbers and compare them with the weapon you've got in your hand. If the weapon you're about to pick up has a higher stat in any regard, the numbers will show up in green text, whereas if they're worse, they show up in red. Thing is though, there's a few personal choices which you might want to take into account when picking certain weapons, which actually brings a lot of depth here. Weapons are ranked on their damage, force, durability and handling. Damage of course relates to the DPS of the weapon, force relates to its knockback capabilities, durability shows how much you'll be able to use it before you have to repair it again, and handling relates to how fast the weapon can be swung, and how much stamina will be taken up when using it. The two most important ones of course are damage and force, as you'll have to personally decide if you want to go for raw damage or use the knockback capabilities to be safer during encounters. Knives for example hardly have any knockback to them, but can oftentimes have a higher DPS. Yet again, it's something that's been implemented into the game where the player has to adapt to their own playstyle, which I really like. It's not forcing you down a certain path, even when taking into account the individual character's special abilities. Most of the time, the durability is fairly negligible if you've got a decent amount of money and resources, but the handling feeds perfectly into the damage and force elements. Handling doesn't just notify us about the stamina effects, but as you'll find, it also lets us know about the ranges of each of these weapons. Close range weapons like the brass knuckles or diving knife are able to be used in very quick succession, which can rack up the DPS. Medium range weapons are ones like the machete or sickle, a more balanced solution which can deal out some good damage while not taking too long to swing. And long range weapons are ones like the sledgehammer and handbow, taking a large amount of damage with each swing, but having those swings take a much larger amount of time to pull off, leaving you more open to attacks as you rear up for one yourself. Once again, this is a choice on the player's part, all having their pros and cons depending on how you personally are tackling fights. Something else you can do with all of these is fling them at your enemies, a nice addition in itself, which you can oftentimes use to knock over a zombie and then destroy them with another one of your attacks, but is also effective when taking into account other combat elements like the propane tanks which can be found lying around, in which you can throw your weapon at them to make them explode.
There are slight annoyances in terms of the throwing here. I don't really know why they chose an automatic lock-on system, when a crosshair would have been much more effective in not only targeting these propane tanks, but also the different parts of the zombies themselves. But it's serviceable enough to where I didn't have many issues with them. There is also ranged weapons, like pistols and rifles, that become more common towards the mid part of the game, but I never enjoyed using these particularly. They become pretty essential during firefights with other humans, but they seem to be lacking any of the punch the melee weapons have, and weren't ever that fun to use for me personally. The progression's also nowhere near as good compared to the melee weapons. The pistol's almost always the best option to go with, considering its very high damage outputs and stability, whereas weapons like the assault rifle just give off too much recoil to be anywhere near as effective. I mentioned the durability system a second ago, and this can sometimes cause problems during fights. That actually being a good thing, as it then encourages you to experiment around with other weapons in the meantime. I say in the meantime, because once these weapons break, they aren't necessarily gone forever, taking us to the workbenches. These can be found pretty frequently throughout the world, but are always placed in your home bases like the lighthouse in the resort, or the church in the city area. They're of course used to repair your weapons, but is also where you'll be dumping a lot of the money and supplies you've been picking up from around the environment and dead zombies. You can not only upgrade your weapon to give them better base stats, but there's also a mod tab where you can apply numerous different status effects to your weapons. This could arguably be one of my favourite elements in the game, as on top of the already wide range of weapons you've got to mess around with, there's also even more personalization that could be done to these so that you can actually decide to attach to certain weaponry, upgrade them to their max potential, and then add a mod to not just make them even more effective, but also look even cooler too. There's tons of mods here, however they're only unlocked through blueprints which can be found around the world, or merely by completing particular quests. There's one final element that I want to mention in relation to the gameplay right now, and that's the leveling system. Completing quests and killing zombies garners you XP, and when you've got enough XP, you level up and gain a skill point, which can be applied to one of the three skill trees we've got here. The more you level up, the more XP you need. Pretty standard stuff. But unlike a lot of games during this period, which use skill trees to merely give the illusion of choice, depending on what tree you focus on here, you might be getting locked out of some pretty significant skills. The skills are the most vital aspect towards what character you want to choose, as although there is quite a bit of crossover between the different character skills, those being ones like unlocking health regeneration or letting you carry more items in your inventory, there's also plenty others which actually correlate to each character's expertise. Using Sam B as an example, across the Fury, Combat and Survival trees, we see the first two in particular are almost entirely focused around his increased effectiveness when using blunt weapons. The Combat tree gives us numerous upgrades in relation to increasing blunt weapons damage capabilities, and the Fury one is all in relation to Sam B's unique Fury mode, this merely being a special ability that we can activate in game, which lets us deal out huge amounts of damage. That's the case for all the survivors, all catering to their abilities once again. Sam B has brass knuckles, Perna has a gun, and so on. Overall, the Fury ability is a fine inclusion, although it's not the power trip I was really hoping for. Especially with characters like Sam B, you've got to get right up close during the Fury, and with it not giving you any kind of invulnerability, it can actually be a lot riskier than you'd think. Back to the skill tree though, I'm mainly happy in relation to the different moves we can unlock, but aside from that, it's just very basic stuff. As you saw, things like damage increases, additional stamina, and increased XP and resources from fights is the norm, but it's in here where we also unlock abilities like the tackle, which can be very useful if you're looking to make your way through enemies quickly, or the brilliant head stomp ability, which can actually be upgraded twice to make it even more effective. I've played so many games at this point, which use skill trees incredibly poorly, so although Dead Islands is still basic, I'm at least happy it uses it to create noticeable changes within the gameplay. It's not layered to the point of games like Skyrim of course, where you'll be tackling the game completely differently depending on what upgrades you decide to choose. But it's fine, just fine. What stuck in my mind more than anything in relation to Dead Island though is that atmosphere of the world. Not to be mistaken with the level design, I think the way the world is laid out can be shaky, going upon terrible at points. But it's the actual look of the game which is fantastic. The resort is by far my favourite location, having a unique sunny twist to tackling the undead, which fits in line with the overall more light-hearted atmosphere throughout the game's duration. The location feels very authentic, being filled with bars, huts, and swimming pools. You really get the sense this place would have been swarming with holiday goers before they were mauled and transformed into the undead. Something else which reinforces the environment is the zombies themselves, most of which are wearing bikinis, shorts, and no shirts. In terms of the level design though, I'm not too big a fan. I enjoy the closeness of everything here, both in terms of the actual distance between certain landmarks and objectives, as well as how enclosed certain spaces can get. You'll find yourself tackling numerous threats inside these claustrophobic huts, which typically presents a bit more panic to your combat encounters, 
sense as there's more chance of getting hit with less room to maneuver or escape. But even on the outside, I do still feel this claustrophobia in certain sections, which works well when making the zombies a more unavoidable threat that you can't just run around. Well, you can, but they'll oftentimes get a swing in, and the infected types are used as a preventative most of the time, so you have to stop and engage in combat. But for as much as I like the opening section, we also have to talk about the other areas here. For those who are unaware, the developers of this game are the same guys who would eventually go on to make Dying Light, a game with the same DNA as Dead Island, but having far more refined gameplay, and a heavy emphasis on parkour, which has pulled off incredibly well. The reason I mention this is because in the second location you travel to, that being Moresby, you definitely get the sense in Dying Light that this is the vision they were heavily invested in. However, in Dead Island, I don't think they pull it off all that well. The level design's pretty great, the claustrophobia I mentioned before is enforced even more here, with the best moments coming from the tight streets and alleyways, and the worst moments coming from a large amount of dead ends I ran across. The Dying Light comparisons become even more apt when you realise this area has more of an adherence to verticality, with several moments where you have to vault on boxes to get over walls and blockades, as well as climbing up and jumping over several rooftops. Unlike Dying Light though, the movement mechanics are incredibly clunky, leading to several moments where I've had to try and try again while falling off the same objects, even though I thought I landed on them fine. The game doesn't seem like it's built for this type of traversal. Sprinting has a sort of wind-up, so you don't get an immediate momentum boost when attempting to make a long jump, and the jumping in general is just too finicky in relation to the objects you're made to climb up on. They don't let you jump high enough really, and the game would have benefited immensely from an actual vaulting system, where your character actually pulls themselves up onto structures. The bad movement does also translate to the driving here. Yes, we have cars, but ultimately I really don't think they should be here. I'd still say these are some of the worst driving mechanics I've experienced in any game I've ever played. The turning is so horrendous that it finds itself being too stiff upon driving at slower speeds, and way too slippery when driving at high speeds. Crashing into anything, and I mean literally anything, stops you dead in your tracks. You can't break through any objects here, and there's no kind of additional movement after you crash. It's just a straight stop. And on the Definitive Edition I'm playing on PC here, the turning was almost completely bugged for me. I'd have to keep moving left and right to actually get the steering to activate, otherwise it would just propel me in a straight line while I've still got the button pressed down. In the resort section though, the driving actually has a function. Things are spaced out enough to where it's still a viable and practical option. But in the city area, there's only one or two cars that we come across, having near to no functionality because of how many broken down cars and debris are scattered on the streets. The city itself looks good, not as strong an atmosphere as the resort, but undeniably thoughtful and layered environments. One thing this area has over most others is the weather effects we see here. Every single other location has static weather conditions. The resort is always sunny and never gets dark. But in the city, we see them not only experiment with different times of day, but we also see rain get introduced. That looks really great, and I only wish they had an option to keep the rain on permanently, but I guess having it happen randomly does vary up the environment quite a bit, and having that surprise make the location stick in players' minds more. There's not much to really say about the sewers in this section, about as linear level design as you can possibly get with these hallways and box rooms which merely vary in size, and the visuals of course are nothing to marvel over either. Although down in these sewers, you'll end up stumbling across one of the proper special enemies in the game. I say proper because realistically the thug zombie type is actually the first one which gets introduced, but their functionalities are merely being a bigger, more powerful zombie that has a much higher potential to knock you down when getting hit. I've never really been a fan of these, they lack the swift, satisfying combat of the normal zombies, and just end up being more of a damage sponge for you to wail on. The rest of the enemy types are very derivative of the special infected from the Left 4 Dead games, but they all work fine enough in terms of Dead Island itself. Suiciders and floaters both crop up in the sewers, suiciders literally being like the boomers, which explode when you get too close to them, while also being an effective enemy to deal damage to surrounding enemies too and Floaters being a slow big boy who spits out acid. The other enemy which shows up in the city is the Ram, which are strong, durable enemies which charge towards you, almost like a certain other enemy I'm familiar with. There's also the punks, policemen, and soldiers that we come up against throughout the game, which have AI so dreadful they almost never know what to do when you're standing right in front of them. And finally, taking us to the jungle section, there's the Butchers, a more interesting damage sponge enemy due to its sheer speed and visceral damage, actually making my encounters with them engaging 
anything compared to the thugs. There's not much to really say about any of these, to be honest. They vary up the zombies enough so that things aren't stale, but they're quite literally the opposite of innovative. Everything they present in this regard, I can see pulled off a lot better by other games. Onto the jungle, though. This is where we start getting into some of the really tedious parts of the game. I think an issue with a lot of these places is that, like the jungle, for example, they already fail in a gameplay sense, but could ultimately still be relevant in a story sense. Think of Lost Isolith from Dark Souls, for example. The entire concept of it is interesting, because the world and story before this has already been intriguing. Even if you're unaware, every area we enter has certain narrative implications, and Lost Isolith is no different. It's just the fact that it was rushed out the door so quickly that it ends up being terrible. Dead Island could have hypothetically justified the existence of the areas outside of the resort if they were fun to play, or if it was really necessary to go to these places in terms of the story. And although that is the case, the story might be the worst part of the game for me. Personally, the only justification for these new locations is variety, nothing more. The city just about gets away with it, but the jungle was inexcusably arduous to go through. We end up here after a string of events where we discover that all our characters are immune, and all have the potential to create a cure to the virus by using our blood. Very simple setup, but between this time, we just get some really bizarre and clunky transitions between story beats that almost never work. For example, the idea to head into the city comes about when the character Cinemoy says his survivors are running low on supplies. The only issue is that all of these survivors, and Cinemoy himself, are not set up anywhere near enough to where this seems like a request that we'd actually go through with. Yet, yeah, we do. Or how about when we meet the character Jin, whose father gets infected in about two seconds after we meet him, and we're expected to care when he tells us to leave him behind. Like, yeah, obviously, go away. Live your life. Jin is about the best character the game creates, and that's not saying much. The only reason I say that is because she actually has a character arc, where she travels with us, goes through some tough times in between, goes back to kill her zombified father, and then dies at the end in a hilarious way. It's another element that appears to be completely thrown to the wayside. The narrative that's portrayed in the game's trailer is unironically better than what we get across the entire game. But I can't deny, although it's inexcusable and truly shows its weaknesses on single player, the story is serviceable enough to where if you're playing online with friends and likely not paying full attention or even caring about the plot, it'll be more than enough to keep pushing you forward. In fact, the cliche and schlocky nature of everything might actually end up enhancing the experience for your group. But playing by myself, I couldn't help but just be bored or feel pitiful for what I was witnessing. There is almost no point where I felt myself attached to any of the characters here, but it's genuinely quite a feat. Although this does end up exposing one element of the game that I feel would have enhanced the story if it didn't feel so lazy, and that's the quests. Main and side quests are almost indistinguishable throughout the entire game, and they go as follows. Talk to a character marked with an exclamation mark on your minimap, in which I should also mention the map takes away so much from the exploration due to you literally being guided with an exact line to your location. Listen to them give some backstory about what they need you to do, which sometimes can be interesting. But that intrigue is almost immediately destroyed when you realise most of the quests are go here, fetch this for me, go here, kill this for me, go here and that's actually about it. There are exceptions, of course. I enjoyed the ones where we actually entered into buildings like the hotel or the several houses around the city. And I also liked particular quests like the Head of Cerberus's, which has you running around rooftops and tracking down speakers. This quest being a great example of how taking away the objective marker actually makes you pay more attention to your surroundings and do some navigation based on your own intuition. And then there's also certain main quests which feature a bit more to them, like the final boss encounter, or as I said, the hotel mission. But they're all just way too standard even quests which seem like they have a unique twist to them all play out the exact same, because in reality, you're still just clearing a room of enemies or guiding some guy to a destination. I feel if there was just more care put into these main quests, the story would have been far more impactful. There doesn't feel like there's a proper progression here, it's just like we're gradually checking things off a list. The combat's the only thing which is making these anything outside of utter tedium. <laughs> The jungle's an environment that starts off interesting, but is once again brought down by the layout of it. This is arguably the area you'll be doing the most running, which I mean is just nothing but watching your stamina deplete and recharge until you reach where you're supposed to go. The cars at least are much more effective here, but you already know they're not the funnest thing to drive around anyway. The actual location looks pretty great, but is once again lacking the uniqueness that was in the resort section. I could point the resort out as something that's distinctly dead islands, but the jungle could realistically be in any game. There's a lack of personality by 
this point, this starts to become an issue for me. Through interacting with a local tribe, being led by a guy called Opie, we stumble across the second key character of the game, being called Yerima. Just like Jin, they give this character almost no character development, so in turn, I never really care about any of her motivations or well-being. You discover her in one of the few cutscenes throughout the game, and although these are all typically fine and played out in-game instead of a pre-rendered cutscene, it's in these where the tone gets really confused. You spend the entire game frolicking around, gleefully swiping heads off zombies, which the characters end up reciprocating in their voice lines. But then all of a sudden in these cutscenes, we get these sad pianos and strings, like they're trying to make an impact of some kind. Is this what you need? Then give me what I need. What are you saying, Dad? Which obviously doesn't work, because no part of the actual game conveys an emotional tone at any point. From the jungle, we end up at the prison, after a guy called Ryder, who communicates with us over the radio, tells us to go there. And this is by far the worst area of the game. Those box hallways and rooms I mentioned in the sewers are even worse here. And there's nothing visually impressive either, it's just concrete walls and iron bars. The quests here too are arguably the most tedious I had to do in the entire game. Going back and forth, doing stuff for this guy called Titus. He asks for one thing in exchange for his help, then another, and then another. It's just incredibly boring. And once we're done with Titus, we have a final boss fight against Ryder, that while not being awful, was nothing to write home about. You literally just survive against some zombies, and then take on an amped up, zombified version of Ryder, who they actually attempt to portray as a villain, despite us hardly interacting with him throughout the game, and only seeing him in person here. Stay back! They hardly seem human! Stop! But killing someone you love? not so easy, is it? Dead Island is one of those games that's filled with fond memories from my youth, but upon going back to play it now, reveals so many flaws that I assume I just wasn't aware of back then. The combat is easily the best part of the game, and it's like that's what they were relying on. That was their best idea, and formed a half-assed, pretty buggy game around it. The visuals, and I mean the graphics, are still fine for the most part. Some of the characters do look weird, to be fair, but all the environments and weaponry look great. The atmosphere is really good for the resort section, but gradually gets worse and worse in each consecutive area. And the story's so bland that the only thing that really stands out are the four characters we play as. Not to mention as well, that despite the sound in general being pretty great, with the guttural, brutal sounds that are let out from the zombies, <laughs> as well as our weapons and the overall ambience of certain areas. The music is the only thing that's lacking. There's nothing that ever really stands out. It's all just very generic. Outside of that though, it's a game that has many pitfalls, but is unique and striking enough in its opening section to warrant the type of nostalgia that I and many others feel in relation to this game. I think we can all agree it's not a masterpiece, but it's like a relic of a bygone era. It's almost fascinating to go back and play this game, considering how the gaming landscape has ultimately tried to move away from this game's core design principles. Outside the story mode though, we can also mess around with one punch mode which is so much fun to play, with how your punches and kicks absolutely obliterate the zombies and fling them miles away. Bloody hell! <laughs> And there's also the Rider campaign, that while not fixing any of the issues that are featured in the main game, at least gives some more context for the villain character, that I assume even the developers knew was poorly set up. Dead Island Riptide came next, and I'll be honest, there's not much to really say about this game when comparing it to the first one. Although it's not referred to as Dead Island 2, it's quite literally a sequel to the first game, and was only titled Riptide due to the fact there was less resources being pumped into it compared to the first one, which I assume was primarily because of the new generations of consoles coming in, where we obviously saw Techland ditch Dead Island in favour of Dying Light for these new consoles. Visually, it's pretty much identical. There are improvements in terms of lighting and particle effects like when you deal damage to zombies, but that's only under very close observation. On the surface, there's nothing that stands out as being distinctly different. Same goes for the environments. We literally start the game off in almost a replica of the jungle section, with some additional annoyances in the form of the swamp areas. Okay, I'll be honest, these are fine, and actually pretty immersive when using the new boat vehicle, which at least functions far greater compared to the cars. But when you're on foot, these slow you down so much the journey becomes a pure slog, with the narrative being the same base concept of the first. The most I can really talk about are some new gameplay concepts and the skill system. Riptide features a nice thing where you can now see all your other teammates at your home base, and on top of that you can also do certain side quests for them too to get rewards in return. In these home bases, you'll end up having to fend off against the undead within a certain area, something which was explored in the arena DLC for the original game, but done very effectively here 
here also. It's just a mechanic which leans heavily into the combat by throwing large hordes at you instead of the more sporadic placement of zombies in the open environment. The skill system, despite being very poorly integrated in terms of the game's balancing, is merely a more expansive version of what we saw previously. The reason I say it's badly integrated is because you start the game off this time at level 15, regardless of what build you can now pick for your character. Those being ones more involved in combat, survival, or just getting the skill points yourself and choosing what to invest in. This makes the intro less friendly to newer players, considering the increased zombie levels too, which means more health and higher damage outputs. And you've also got to consider that in the first game, by the time you've reached this level, you would most likely have acquired and upgraded some weaponry. Whereas here, there's this confused approach of giving you some terrible weapons off the bat, which makes killing zombies a chore. Then they give you some incredibly powerful weapons to cap off the prologue, and then they strip them all away from you again. The skill tree is good though, with some slightly more unique abilities on offer here. One thing I really liked was how you could import your Dead Island character from the first game and play as them here, which means any abilities like the stomp or tackle would also carry over. But here, aside from the typical damage and fury upgrades for their individual character's strong abilities, we also have things like being able to get up faster when getting knocked down, or a skill which deals increased amounts of damage to the opposite sex, still basically serving the same purpose from before, but having more variety, which is always welcome. Overall though, Riptide, not a fan. There's way too many bugs which carry over from the first game, like how it's incredibly easy to get yourself stuck in certain parts, requiring you to restart from a checkpoint. I still don't like how your kick can oftentimes be far more effective than your actual weaponry, and realistically, the only positives I pick out from the experience are more nuanced to what's actually introduced in this game, and even then, they have counterpoints which makes me wonder if they're better off without them. The Drowners, for example, were a new type of zombie that reside in the swamps, either bursting up and surprising you on foot, or grabbing on and potentially knocking you off your boat. They're good, so you have to take more consideration in your actions, and have to actively use the boost ability on your boat to counteract these guys' incoming attacks. But then, you've also got the swamps themselves, I don't really like them at all, and would take the trade of getting rid of the drowners if it meant the swamps were made more satisfying to traverse. But that's not all of course, we also have yet another cloned area of the first game, and that's the city of Henderson, which does look very nice to be honest, and isn't laid out anywhere near as bad as the jungle section either. By this time, you would have stumbled across the rest of the new special enemies here, which I mean visually look good, but I mean come on. The wrestler literally looks like the charger from Left 4 Dead, and is another one which just smacks you around. The grenadier almost has the exact same functionalities as the floater, by being a zombie with toxic ranged attacks. And there's also the screamer, being the only truly unique one here, by letting out an incapacitating scream when you're close to it. Stepping away from Riptide though, as I said, I don't find much merit or interesting things to actually say about it. Only this year did we finally get the true follow-up to Dead Island in the form of Dead Island 2, a game that was in development hell for around 10 years, being passed through numerous different developers' hands until it was finally completed by Deep Silver Dan Buster Studios. And for a game that seemed like it was inevitably going to be a nightmare, I was pleasantly surprised that it not only fixes tons of issues I had with the first two games, but in general, I found to be a pretty satisfying experience all round. Now, it sticks quite close to the core values of the first game, which I think is good, but has led to some criticisms about the game feeling outdated. Which, to be honest, with how similar these larger gaming experiences are starting to become, is almost like a breath of fresh air. Starting with the positives, the game looks fantastic. I really like the Los Angeles environment we're set in, which despite not really being an island, I think features areas which are far more consistently good in both their design and atmosphere. At the start of the game, you're still able to choose what character you'd like to play as, now switching out the old ones for new modern characters, which despite not minding any of them really, I also found weren't striking in their own rights. The overall writing of the game can go from cliche to cringy, and your character's dialogue, which can now be heard very frequently, is usually the worst reflection of this. Bruno, you may now kill the bride. <laughs> For my first playthrough, I played as Bruno, who I merely found to be serviceable. Only towards the closing parts of the game, where they try to make you care about the protagonist, did I realise I didn't really care about him at all, which goes for most of the other characters we meet throughout the game. Yet again, bar for Sam B, the only returning character from the previous games. Hey, Emma's pretty shook up. How about you fix her some of that motherfucking Yorkshire pudding shit she likes? It's a Dead Island game though, and everything would end up falling down if the combat wasn't up to scratch. Thankfully though, I really loved it, and it's once again the best part of the experience. All the updated weaponry looks fantastic, and the overall progression here I found to be a lot smoother than previously, with your escalating level eventually leading to your older weaponry becoming pretty useless against the zombies, which also level up alongside you. A negative in terms of attaching to and holding on to weaponry you're familiar with, but a 
major positive in making you vary up the weapons you're upgrading and using, which of course puts even more weight on your exploration, as you'll need quite a large amount of money and resources to level these up this time round. All the elements like damage, force and handling still come into play here, with large hammers taking long to get hits off but letting out large amounts of damage in return, something which is amplified even more with the charge attack which is featured here, an element which feels essential here and will always be missed when going back to the previous titles. Some of the best changes come in the form of the stamina and the zombies themselves. Stamina is no longer used up while sprinting and during combat, which in terms of the exploration I was very happy about, considering it wasn't just annoying to be constantly running out of stamina in the first game, but also because vehicles are entirely removed here, which if the first game's driving mechanics are anything to go by, is a major positive. During combat though, I was initially hesitant. I wasn't sure if this was going to mess up the satisfying flow which was present in the first game, but this couldn't be any further from the truth, as I believe Dead Island 2's combat excels in so many more ways. In exchange for there being no more stamina issues during combat, the zombies are now more visceral with their attacks, which ends up putting more emphasis on your movement and positioning. This mainly comes in the form of the dodge and block abilities we now have, where with the dodge, we can swiftly move out the way of a zombie in preparation for a devastating counter, or instead parry with a block for the same effect. Another thing I was worried about was the satisfying aspect in relation to the destruction of the zombies. The game starts off with the zombies appearing to be less reactive to our hits, almost standing in place and taking this onslaught without being flung around that much. But this changes pretty quickly when acquiring some of the more devastating weaponry, where a lot of these almost feel like I've turned on one punch mode with how they get wildly flung around when being hit and killed. The sheer gore that's on show here might be some of the best I've ever witnessed in any game, primarily because it's dynamic and isn't solely limited to set animations that we would have seen previously. Hitting zombies still has blood bursting out of them, but now we can see this blood accurately laid down when falling to the ground, which ends up interacting with other fluid systems in the game to even greater effect. Status effects are used really well here, where now items like the jerry can and the brand new water can can be thrown and exploded to either set the zombies alight or merely douse them in these fluids, which, as you could assume, means the gas can then be ignited to set them on fire, and the water can be electrified to electrocute the zombies. And talking of that, the gore elements are just astounding. In terms of the fluid example I just mentioned, the zombies will be completely scolded upon these status effects being applied to them, but that's not even mentioning the raw damage here. Continuing to wail on zombies reveals the physics-based gore system that's been put in place, where not only can each individual body part be maimed and cut off, but also when looking to their innards, we see their entrails have dynamic physics to them, with the same going for their jaws and skulls, which can be destroyed bit by bit so their jaw is either loosely hanging from their mouths, or completely removed. There is still somewhat of a damage sponge nature to these guys, but because of how satisfying I found the damage effects and the combat in general to be here, I was more willing to get into even the most optional of fights, whereas before I found myself just trying to run past everything after a certain point. There's a lot of elements that have been reworked and streamlined here, which I think were all appropriate for the most part. The skill system for one has stepped away from leveling up skill trees, and instead changed to these skill cards, still having several different trees with cards that adhere to different types of ability and survivor skills. I do enjoy this system even more than the one before though, as unlike back then, there's not only more noticeable effects which get applied, like the ability to have zombies explode after being killed, or the drop kick and ground pound abilities that can be applied. They're also static, we don't have to gradually upgrade different abilities to get what we really want. We're given the skill immediately, with the main choice coming from a personal decision on what skills we'd like to choose over others. Something that could become quite a hard choice, considering how many good abilities there are here. Once again, working very nicely to vary up and adhere to different players' playstyles. And we also have the return of the workbenches, to repair, upgrade and modify our weapons once again. This being the most noticeably streamlined element for me, with how modifications are now handed out far more sparingly, and apply to most of the weapons you acquire, instead of the more restrictive process from before. With there also being several other mods we can add aside from the status effect, which further improves elements like how much damage the weapons give out, and making their ability to damage limbs greater. There are certain trade-offs which could be made here, like the upgrades which add damage to the weapon but reduce its durability, but for the most part, a lot of these are just static upgrades, which is perfectly fine. Something else I really enjoyed was the game's overall structure, and also the quests we tackle while going through the story. The plot is once again all based around us being immune, and hoping to acquire a vaccine with our blood. I mean, it's literally one for one the same thing. Our main objective for the first half is to get to a doctor, just like the first game. But unlike there, where every single quest was pretty much the same thing rinse and repeat, there's a lot more variation to both the main and side quests here. You're going through more unique structures here, and achieving objectives that actually feel like they're pushing the narrative forward, not just stalling time while you're waiting to travel to the next area. There's some really fun ones 
chance here. Like when we have to creatively kill zombies in a number of ways for a social media influencer. Although, some of the things she says are foul and totally unredeemable. Let them bodies hit the floor! <laughs> Or when we end up in a hotel and have to face off against the towering Goliath of Becky the Bride. There's just so much more to actually see here. It's not just fetch quest after fetch quest. And even within these quests, different events happen during them which are unexpected and throw us off guard. Like when we end up gaining the Fury ability for the first time. We're merely supposed to be heading through the sewers, but get cut off by what we perceive as a new antagonist and thrown into a pit of zombies below. I can't think of one moment like that from the first game, at least not one that's played out as well as this. The only objective that I really think gets repeated over and over is the kill em all task, which locks us into a certain area and has us fend off an onslaught of zombies, much like the defense missions from Riptide. But once again, the combat is so satisfying that I have no issues with these at all. In fact, I was always pretty excited when I'd see the message flash up on screen. Dead Island 2 somewhat exposes how simple the fixes were to merely make the first game a more satisfying experience all round. The combat in both games is great, albeit quite a bit better in the second game, but all that would have been needed to keep the first one in engaging for me is a proper narrative progression. Dead Island 2's isn't good, but at least it's always in the foreground. The original doesn't even feel like anything's connected for the majority of it. Another improvement I see in this sequel was the complete removal of human enemies. Even though I'm sure they could have pulled it off fine enough, the zombies still present enough variety to not get stale for the endurance of the game. Most of the enemies are pretty much the same to be honest, with some different variations on ones like the Screamer, who also features an electric counterpart, or the Crusher, which is basically the thug but with more distinct abilities like a ground smash, which can knock you over. But the newer stuff comes in the form of the different zombie types and the brand new mutator enemy. The mutator being a grotesque abomination, which is very durable, deals out high amounts of damage from its hits and spikes, and can also deal out those AoE attacks the crushers do. It's easily one of the strongest enemies in the entire game, and that's probably why it gets reused for the final boss encounter, despite also seeming quite lazy to me. The boss fight itself actually being one of the most difficult triumphs I've pulled off in a game as of late, though while making me incredibly angry at the time, was pretty fair and intense all things considered. But the zombies themselves also have various types, which are immune to certain weapons and modifications. Firefighter zombies for example were completely invulnerable to fire damage, and the same goes for the incendiary crushers and walkers. And although this can be annoying at points, in a game sense it's making the player more aware of the weaponry they're using, and requires them to not just switch up their weapons, but also if you don't have any appropriate weaponry to deal with these things at the time, will encourage players to be more varied with their modifications choices in the future. Wrapping up the experience though, the sound in general is fantastic, with all of the hits and swipes on the zombies sounding meaty and damaging. <laughs> as well as all of the gun sounds being grand and explosive. The music, despite still being pretty bland for the most part, at least has some more engaging moments, particularly during some of the defense objectives. The cutscenes which are frequently scattered throughout the game all look good, and due to my character actually interacting with the people this time around, I was more willing to engage and actually invest in this very by the numbers plot. Throwables, which were featured in the previous games, are now a special ability which features a cooldown timer, much better than the awkward throwables that we previously had to switch to like an actual weapon. Despite hearing criticisms that the environments are bland and too similar to each other, I thought they all looked great and worked better as one cohesive experience, compared to the other games which put variety over an actual believable location. And there's some real subtle things I can praise the game over, like how the medkits are actually effective this time round, due to the snacks being far less common than before, which I should mention were essentially the main way of replenishing health in the previous games. Or how searching through trash cans and suitcases this time round is far more convenient, with how opening these up automatically gives us the resources, instead of requiring separate button pushes to actually get them. Kicks are now almost useless outside of our drop kicks and our stomp, which is a huge positive considering our kicks were almost more powerful than our weapons in the previous games. The guns here don't just sound good, but they're also incredibly satisfying to use now, with certain ones like the hunting rifle exploding zombies heads with ease. 
and although the writing can at times be awful, they at least convey the tone a lot more clearly than before. Even in its most serious moments, things are still handled pretty lightheartedly, which I think is more than fine for the type of game this is. Yes, it feels derivative. Yes, I can clearly see things which have been snatched by other games like Dying Light. And no, I don't think it's a masterpiece, but it's an experience that I was fully invested in while playing, and was satisfying enough for me to want to go back and experience it again through the eyes of another one of these characters. Just so you're aware, I'm taking no pity on this game because of the development issues. If it was awful, I'd say it's awful, but it's really strange the backlash this game has gotten, because I think it's genuinely good. Time might warp that belief perhaps, but I had a lot more fun with this game compared to anything else that's been coming out in recent memory. The YouTuber Critical described this game somewhat as comfort food, and I completely understand what he means by that. Because it's, like, it's a comfort food, you know exactly what you're getting when you order the Dead Island dish. You're getting a generic zombie experience, but it has that extra seasoning of some very, very beautiful gore. It's like we're playing an updated version of an old relic, but despite the game's shortcomings, I thought it was not only great by itself, but a vast improvement on what we saw before. And finally, despite the level design not being drastically different from the first, there's way more interactivity within the environment here, which can lead to some good puzzle solving moments. They are all pretty simple to be fair, just things like finding circuit breakers to unlock doors, but it's another element which makes you take in the world more and actually appreciate the design of it. A much better improvement over Dead Island's original map system, which basically had players gluing their eyes to the white dotted line the entire time. So there you have it. Dead Island is a franchise that has a strange amount of love surrounding it, and by the end of checking these games out, you can really see where this was initially garnered. Dead Island was released during a period where zombies were still fresh, and the ideas it was presenting were ones that broke certain conventions, like having zombies always be revolved around darkness, night, and bleakness. Whereas I really don't think the originals have aged all that well, the redeeming factors they do present are ones that are still vivid in my memory. It's a game that stands out, as opposed to being merely forgotten, and with the sequel, they only amplify that aspect even more, using highly detailed, real-world locations and one of the best gore systems in gaming to once again prop up what could be a pretty banal experience. But in my eyes, it's actually nice to have a fully-fledged experience nowadays, considering so many games now are released in an unfinished and buggy state. It does have DLC, but nothing that would make anyone feel like they're truly missing out on something core to the game. Overall though, I'm still a fan of the series. It presents an atmosphere and gameplay system that hasn't quite been replicated by another game in its genre. A hard feat for even some of the best games which are released. And although the nightmare of Dead Island 2's development could possibly lead to the series never seeing a new entry again, I'm glad the world actually got to experience this sequel. Because for many Dead Island and zombie fans, I can guarantee that if you're looking for violence, blood, and gore, these games definitely don't disappoint. And if you want some side-scrolling zombie action, they've also got you covered with the Retro Revenge spin-off game, that while of course not being as substantial as the mainline games, still presents some rhythm-based CRT screen gory action that can be good to kill some time with. Although Techland's Dying Light series seems to excel in a lot more departments, Dead Island will always be a series that I'll keep coming back to as the years go on. Not solely for the obvious things like the combat and gore systems, but also for a morbid curiosity in terms of how these games are going to age over time.